Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Today, we have a special focus on a podcast dedicated to the Toronto municipal political scene, the Municipals. The Municipals is hosted by the dynamic duo of Matthew King, a seasoned podcaster and host of This Time in History, and Philip Mills, a former Toronto City Council candidate from 2021. Together, they bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table, offering insightful commentary on municipal affairs in Canada's largest city. Their podcast is certainly a resource for anyone interested in the intersection of local, provincial, and federal politics and how these three layers of governments impact the city of Toronto. So in today's episode, we'll explore the current state of municipal politics in Toronto, take a closer look at Mayor Olivia Chow's first year in office, and discuss the significant challenges that lie ahead for the city. Whether you're a Toronto resident or a passionate about urban governance as they are, this episode promises to provide valuable perspective and thought-provoking discussion on everything Toronto. This is Municipal Affairs. Matthew, Philip, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I'm looking forward to diving into Toronto municipal politics, to the city of Toronto, or as we call it out here in the West, the center of Canada, because everything happens in Toronto, it seems like, and nothing ever comes out West. So I want to start by asking the first sort of simple question, but it's an overarching one. Uh, and it's uh, we'll start with Matthew, if you don't mind. How did the idea of the municipals come about? Well, that's a that's a great question, and uh, it's it's actually best to go to me because uh, I started it all. Uh, what happened was I was uh, I have another podcast that I still do from time to time, and it was 2022, and the municipal election was coming up, and I said to myself, "Okay, we're doing history, but I want to cover the election." And then the co-host I had at the time, he's like, "Nah, I'm okay." So I was like, "That's okay. I'm gonna do this." So I did the whole 2022 uh, municipal election by myself. I did a lot of interviews. I interviewed a lot of candidates. Some of them got elected. Most of them didn't. Philip was one of the uh, people that I um, that I interviewed. And uh, after the election ended, uh, I ended it with a live YouTube special. And then uh, I went on vacation. When I came back from vacation, I contacted Phil. I said, hey, um, you seem like a good dude. I know we're not politically uh, uh, matched, but I think that's a good thing. Do you want to start a podcast together? I want to leave the history on my other podcast, and I want. I think municipal politics uh, deserves its own podcast. And and at the time, I hadn't seen anything like that um, with the limited scope that I that I I looked around, and so. I said, Philip, let's do this. He came up with the name. I came up with the format. And then we just kind of ran with it. And um, our first episode uh, was just us. But then we we brought out the big guns. We we had Chloe Brown on really er like the first episode. First, I mean, really, yes, early, yeah. really early. We had Norm Norm De Pasquale on. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a few. But th those are the names that come to mind. So for those who don't know, Chloe ran for mayor of Toronto in the 2022, 21, 21 municipal 22. election, 22 municipal election. And Norm is, and I just want to make sure that I know because I, I'm not, I'm blanking on the person right now. Phil's, Norm is who? Phil's better with that one. Norm is uh, who? Norm is, is, Norm is more of a, um, uh, a local activist. He is in charge of Ontario Place for All right now. He previously did No Jets T.O., and he was a candidate for city council for um, uh, Ozma Malik's ward, ward 10, I believe. No, I, nope, I nope, think... nope. You're ward right. 11. It's not ward 10. Ward 11. Um, yeah, Diane Sachs's ward, yeah. And and also he was a former federal candidate for the NDP in Spadina Fort Yard. So... For you, Philip, you have a municipal background because in that election that we we're just talking about, you were actually a candidate on the ballot. And if you've listened to my sister show, Cross Border Interviews, I always ask the simple question. And since you put your name on the ballot, I've got to ask you this question. What was it about municipal politics that drew you to it? Uh, that's that's a very good question because it's like, you know, the more I want to say a lot of people who are into politics, but kind of very 
um, I want to say, I don't want to say shallowly, but I mean like with minimal information, a lot of people focus on federal politics in the same way as if we focus on American politics, people are kind of focused on the country as opposed to individual states or cities. And I just, I got the sense that most of the issues that I was having as an individual was more happening at the local level. And and the more I paid attention to municipal politics, the more that it sort of became, uh, it just seemed like an area that I could feel that I could impact it more. I, I didn't think there was really an opportunity for me to join one of the established parties for provincial or federal politics. So municipal just, it really picked my interest. So I just want to make sure that I'm not doing, I'm doing my due diligence here, Matt. Had you ever put, Matthew, did you ever put your name on the ballot or had you ever considered it? So ever since Rob Ford was the mayor, I have wanted to do that so badly, but it was never the right time, you know. Um, But in 2026, I am going to run for city council in Ward 1, Etobicoke North. Uh, We've been talking about that for, for quite a while on our show. Uh, that is the plan, and um, I- I'm ready. Let's let's go. So that, with that being said, let's dive into the city of Toronto and the state of the city of Toronto and the municipal sector of the city of Toronto. And I want to get this first question out of the way, and I'm going to start with Philip, if you don't mind. In your opinion, what is the state of municipal governance and municipal politics in the city of Toronto today? Would you say? So I feel like the city has sort of been left in a bad state of more than a decade of austerity politics by our previous mayors, John Tory and Rob Ford. Um, Matthew, I think will have a different opinion on, on where we stand, but that that's sort of um, where I see Olivia Chow is elected mayor and she has a lot of fixing up to do. Now it's not, the mayor isn't the sole person to solve all of our problems, but uh, our Garbage bins have been a mess. We've got our streets are in desperate need of repair. TTC is in a financial crisis. Like it's it's everything we've put off so much of our infrastructure of our repairing that it's going to cost us so much more money to get into like a good state of repair in the city. It's it's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be really tough. And I just I, I feel like that's where we kind of are. We're in a, like a bad position that we have to dig ourselves out of. Do you think? Chow can do Mayor Chow can do it because we are so she got elected a year ago to like literally in June, June 21st, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she has, I think, almost a year and a half, two years until the next general election in 2026 to potentially do something as her first term. Do you think she can do it, Philip? Great question. Um, I I want to believe that she can. Only because the impression I get from the other people who've wanted to run, you know, a lot of people promising freezing property taxes and we need those revenues sort of thing. The only candidate who is willing to say out loud, like we need to tax, we need to like bring those revenues up. I, I think any other leader is going to promise. And again, it's a, it's a very tempting promise. People are going to hear it and people are going to be like, Oh, hell yeah. I, I don't want more taxes. Um, but I, I think any other leader would kind of put that up. And I'm worried that if Olivia Chow doesn't use her political capital very quickly right now, I, I think the city is going to be in a bad place, to be honest. So let's hear from the other host, co-host of the municipals. Uh, Matthew, from your standpoint, what is the state of municipal politics in the city of Toronto today? Well, you know, I agree with Philip. Uh, uh, Olivia Chow but- inherited a mess. But it's, it's it's what it's what you do about it, and um, I mean I mean everything that Philip said is is correct. I just her approach is is the sticking point. That's where he and I disagree. Um, she made uh, Phil. You might have to help me out with this one, but she made three pledges during the by election. One was she would not use the strong mayor powers. She used them. Another was there would be no encampments during her term. There is at least one that we are aware of um, at the St. Stephen's Church. And the third one, Phil, I can't remember. 
Oh, was the third one? I think the third one, or at least something that I would focus on. Oh, is Ontario place. commitment to Ontario place. Yeah, she and, she and 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 I've said this on our show. Even though I think it was a great deal, it doesn't match what came out of her mouth, and that's the issue I have. I want our I, and I know that it's it's it may look like it may sound like we want to live in fantasy land, but I want our politicians' actions to meet what comes out of their mouth so but let's let's speak let's let's bring it down to reality here that never happens no matter who you get no matter what politician you elect municipally provincially or federally the actions are never going to match what the words are yes there's going to be a few they can say they can throw you a bone and say hey look what we did look look at this great promise that we've made and we're trying to get it through but gar we just don't have enough money is absolutely it- Okay, but go ahead. Absolutely, but a lot of that I I like I separate the federal and provincial government from municipal from the municipal government based on the fact that the federal and provincial governments are parties which are controlled by party leaders and controlled by the donors who donate where municipals are one person. And yes, they may um subscribe to a certain party's um, ideological stance or they may have previously been a part of it and are not anymore but are closely aligned or fill in the blank uh, but again you're dealing with one person and yes like I said Olivia Chow's been NDP before but right now she's just Olivia Chow she's purple so. Olivia Chow don't you know according to her signs <laughs> that's all I remember from that election is the purple and I was like okay go for purple only one um well so the you... one thing the one thing I will say is it's not my fault I voted for Chloe Brown <laughs> I also endorsed Chloe Brown um so we are a year into her mandate and I want to just ask a simple, I, I always say simple question, but they're never simple because there's always overarching. And then I ramble on for five minutes, but looking back on her first year is Toronto getting what she, she offered. Who wants to take that? You go ahead, Philip. You know what? There are, there are small, there are a few things that Olivia Chow is doing absolutely really well on. And I, I feel like it's a lot of the the surface level stuff that has been ignored due to again the austerity politics. The garbage bins. I I get the sense that the garbage bins are being picked up more frequently. Park washrooms are are open and functional. There's a park near my house called Dunlop Park that is, has a bathroom that's been locked for years. This year, I just approached it, just sort of tenting it, and it it just it opened it, it and it was clean and it was functioning. So Olivia Chow is doing a lot of the surface level stuff that's really great. Um, I'm very, I think you'll get a sense of, of my ideology in terms of uh, the police, which is a very, a very negative view. And I, I feel like there's been this image that Olivia Chow is anti-police, but has, but has given them everything they've wanted, Not which is, it's funny budget. that I'm presenting that. No, she, okay. She, the Toronto police asked for more money the toronto the initial budget uh missed what they were asking for by 12 million dollars now i would argue against the characterization that for example uh toronto sun uh author not author journalist brian Lilly had he had phrased that as a defunding of the police while that was still it was still funding above the last year's tr- toronto police budget now then the Toronto police did a, a whole campaign, really a fear mongering campaign about how the city will go into chaos if they don't get the last $12 million for that budget. And then the mayor did vote to give them the rest of that money. So she's, again, it's funny that I'm presenting that as a bad thing, but I'm sure most people who sort of view Olivia Chow as this like pinko commie anti-police person uh, would, wouldn't characterize it the same way I would. 
John Tory was famously good friends with Doug Ford. They were kind of on good terms with each other. They had known each other for some time. I would say John Tory and even Justin Trudeau had known each other for some time, and they were probably good friends as well. Um, do you get a sense that the relationship, and this is to Matthew, that the relationship between the other levels of government have changed dramatically since Chow has been in office? Or is it just steady as you go and Toronto just asks for things and hopes Hopefully one of the governments will pick it up. Or do you find that Chow is sort of buddy, buddy with Ford or Trudeau more than Tory was? I would say that she's buddy, buddy more with Trudeau. Um, I mean, Doug Ford is quoted as saying that Olivia Chow becoming mayor would be the worst thing for Toronto. Um, And every time she touts about getting, um, investments, it's always from the federal level. Uh, not to say that the provin- the province hasn't uh, uh, chipped in. It's just I've only ever heard her highlight investments from the federal government. Okay, so there's been one topic that you guys talk about a lot on your show, and we're going to dive into it now. And it's kind of controversial. And for those who are listening who uh, struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder or any type of challenges with mental health and addiction, please note that there are resources available to get that. Let's talk about drugs. This has been a hot topic, not only in Toronto, but across Canada. Uh, Vancouver just went through uh, sort of de- decriminalization of uh, drugs. And then they asked the federal government to overturn that and actually repeal that and actually criminalize all the drugs that were decriminalized a few years prior. Toronto made that pledge or ask of the federal government to do that in Toronto. But Health Canada and the Trudeau government said, no, not going to happen. Philip, actually, I'll start with Matthew because I think this is going to be his in his wheelhouse, and I think he has a few things to say. What the hell is going on in Toronto, where they're seeing what's happening in Vancouver and saying that's a great idea, let's bring it to Toronto? Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about um, in terms of Olivia Chow. But I, I, you know what? I can't even put this on her because, unbeknownst to me, and I haven't been corrected by anybody, which I invited anyone to do on my on our last show this um request this hundred and what was it 53 page request went straight from the toronto board of health straight to the federal government so we have the federal government doing federal government things the provincial government doing provincial government things the board of health is making requests to directly to the federal government and, and and also all the COVID stuff and the city council's over here arguing about changing street names. Let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> and do, then, do, do you get a sense of where this came from? Do you get a sense is this the board of health just trying to try to do something different in the time where things that have been going the way that they have been going and things haven't gotten better so let's try something different or does toronto get a sense that this is coming from somewhere and i see philip nodding his head so we're going to throw it over to philip in two seconds but i want uh, matthew to finish off his uh, uh sort of thought process there on that question well you see i think the ideology of how to fix the drug problem and again i'm not a uh, I, i'm certainly not in a position to say well they're, they're, this is the way it should be done. But I am a, a person who, I mean, we, we, we talked off air. I've said it on my show. I had a brother who died in Seton House. Again, I've never been in Seton House, but I assume not every person there is getting their own room. So he wasn't alone smoking his crack pipe, which was laced with fentanyl, and he died. The whole point of this thing, as Phil and I covered on our show, is people to to flush the shame down the drain people will go to these safe injection sites and i don't know do their drugs together uh do them in the in in the supervision of people running the safe injection sites but i i gotta be honest with you i I, that that's not practical people that in my opinion people that uh, uh like to dabble in drugs they could be compared to people who drink and a lot of people I used to drink I don't anymore 
I never wanted to do it in public. I always did it in private because I'm watching the game or whatever. And if I'm out, then I don't have to drive because I never drink and drive. And it so it to me it doesn't make sense. But uh, I'll I'll let you uh, uh, comment on that or, or throw it to Phil. Bill, what about yourself? Um, and I'm going to play a little devil's advocate with you because I feel like you're on the opposite end of where uh, uh, Matthew stands here. Okay. In Alberta alone, we're trying this recovery process. We're not, we're not safe, safe injection sites are very hard to come by here in Alberta because we think that recovery and rehabilitation is the path forward. Why would that not be the path forward for Toronto? Do you think? Do you think that the Board of Health is, or even Council, because let's be honest, whatever the Board of Health does is technically a mandate of the City of Toronto's Council. So therefore, even though they passed it and they sent it to the federal government, it's them. Do you think this Board of Health has sort of overstepped its authority in asking for this without? going the proper route and asking the counselors for their opinion. Excellent. Excellent positioning. Um, in fact, I'm very, I'm, I'm very happy that you bring up the Alberta recovery model. Um, and it's, it's not specifically because I want to tarnish one or the other. I think the big problem with this, with the conversation about, safe supply, injection sites versus treatment and recovery, it is in fact the fact that it's being presented as these oppositional ideas. Frankly, I think the best path for success would be a combination of both. The The big idea behind safe supply is simply that if these people are already going to search, search out for these drugs, are going to take these drugs already, and you know they're going to go for them anyways. I think the hope with safe supply is that these people will simply be allowed to stay alive until they kind of seek treatment because you can't, I think my big issue, my big issue with the, with the treatment model is entirely, and this could just be a perception. I I could be off, but it's the idea that people are being forced into treatment like the, uh, you know, judges or criminal courts or whatever. And I, I think if you're, if you personally aren't seeking to be sober, I, I don't think the programs work. Uh, so frankly, I just think it's, it's a combination of everything. And the fact that it's become a battle of which, which program works better on its own. And I, I, I think we've lost the plot when we, when we present them as oppositional ideas. Now, as for, has the Board of Health overstepped Toronto Council to do this? If they yes, have, we yes should know. No. If if they oh, have. Oh, okay. If if they yeah. have. If um, they have, because we're just going off of uh I'm just going off of what Matthew said because I have no confirmation that it was or wasn't, oh, or enough. if it was the direction of council to send this letter. I cannot confirm this as recording this. So maybe afterwards I might be able to get some clarification from someone in Toronto because we're having a city councilor from Toronto on the show later on in well, June. So I will ask that question. Um well but, I look I, I can tell oh. you that. I, I did research, and this goes as far back as a Board okay. of Health uh, YouTube, because back then it was all uh, because because of COVID. COVID. Yeah. So it's all online. It's all Zoom. Um, and it goes back to December 6, 2021. That's the, the Board of Health meeting that it was decided at. And they just sent it this month? God, Toronto. Well, I mean, oh no, I think it's been waiting long. for a while. Okay. I was like, yeah. wow, no, that's, 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 <laughs> no, that's that's politics that's, is layout. <laughs> no, yeah, that's oh, the, yeah. that's the genesis of it. That's when it started. Oh, okay. okay. And okay. in fact, great. I, I, I do want to say great addition of the it, it's kind of my mixed feelings on if the Board of Health, if they are again, if they're overriding council. There's an element where there's a part of me that says, no, there's a proper way we have to go through council. And then there's another aspect where Toronto City Council loves to send things to committee, to reports. And a lot of the times I do get the sense that that is done to slow things down that they don't actually want to do, to just kind of 
say no, but in a very kind of polite political way. So there's an element of, I want to, I want to call it leadership, to sort of bypass council to get this done. It, I'm mixed on it, but I, I, as I'm saying, I do think this is, it's the right thing to do. I, I know it's not, it's not a universal feeling, of course. So tr- for those who are, aren't aware, back in the end, I just had to make sure that I'm getting, I, I can't quick my internet slow because we're doing this right now. Um, I, I just want to make sure, I think it was the early eight, late 80s, early 90s, when the amalgamation of the Metropolitan of Toronto became one of five cities. So there was York, Etobicoke, uh, Scarborough, downtown Toronto, and I, I, I don't remember the fifth, but it could only be four. I think it was probably. around... 99 2000 that happened was it 99 it was mel lastman was the first yeah. mayor of the of yes. yeah, yeah, the, yeah 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 okay so you were from matthew you're from etobicoke which is on the sort of west side of toronto uh philip from uh the conversations i have listened to the episodes i've listened to of the municipals uh you're in the scarborough area because that's where you ran because i, I heard that you said that you're MP was Bill Blair, and I know that writing quite well because I had a former guest on the show who talked about it, Dan Harris. So I want to ask, so is this issue a cross-city issue or is it a downtown issue? Because we often forget whenever we talk about major issues that are going on in municipalities, especially larger urban centers like Toronto, Ottawa, even Calgary or Edmonton, we say, oh, Calgary is under an epidemic of this, that or the other. But then when you look at the data, it's usually coming from one section of the city. In Toronto, are you seeing the drug issue problem as a cross-city issue or as a more Scarborough issue, a more Etobicoke issue, a more downtown issue? I would argue that it's a downtown issue. And if you hear that Toronto is under a drug ep- epidemic, in my opinion, it is because the bulk of the city councillors, they see Toronto as downtown. That's it. Would you agree with that, Philip? It's it's definitely a bigger issue downtown. It's not that it's non-existent in the boroughs. It's but it's it's a lot. It is a smaller issue. It's also more invisible because I mean, really, where people are going to be doing drugs, there's not there's it's less concentrated in the boroughs, right? So there's not as many people sort of just floating around. It's definitely more of a downtown issue, but it's not non-existent elsewhere. Um, can I ask a hypothetical question to both of you? So we're a year into Chow's mayoral term. Would we be having the same discussion? And I, I, I'm i just reading her name, and I apologize if I get it incorrect here. Anna Balau was the mayor, do you think? I, I don't know that I would have the same opinion as Philip. But um, I, maybe. Um, okay. I think the, we we absolutely would. You think so? Do you so? It's well, not a it's not a Chow issue. This drug issue. It's a Toronto issue. And I just want to make sure I clarify that because people might jump on and say, "Oh, we're bashing Olivia Chow," and I'm not. I'm not at all. I'm no, saying that I, no. This, abs- Go ahead. Absolutely, it's a Toronto issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And about, I, I think especially Saunders? with... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Um, Matthew, would you like to take Saunders? I am... Dead air is always great for an audio show, man. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> glad that... <laughs> I'm very glad that Mark Saunders is not the mayor. I'll just say that. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, so we talked about Olivia Chow. We talked about the drug issue, but I want to talk about the dynamics of city council as a whole, because unfortunately, as the time of recording this, actually, by the time this airs, I think the celebration of life will be happening for one of the uh, councillors for uh, Toronto. And I think her name was Councillor Jane Robinson. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Yep. Okay. Jane, Don't know Jane Robinson. Right. Jane so Robinson. let's, let's take her out of the equation right now. Respect the people who have passed, but, the dynamics on Toronto Council, which I watch from on a on a reoccurring basis, because I'm one of those nerds who watches council meetings. It seems Me like they they are they are in a uh, an era of continuous election cycle right now. 
because they have a new mayor. They, this new, the whole council is kind of in this point of we're getting ready for the 2026 election and we're already drawing the lines in the sand. Is that, would, would that be a, a keen observation from an outsider's perspective? Well, this whole election cycle, as you put it, was started by none other than John Tory. He resigned. Then we had the by by election, and uh, uh, Olivia Chow won. But in order to run in that election, Mitzi Hunter had to resign from her spot. So her spot at the provincial level became available. Okay, Gary did Crawford. she have to? Re- did she have to resign though? Because I worked at she Queens did. Park for nine months, and I don't think only if you're elected, or is it in the Alberta in the Ontario Legislature handbook that you have to resign if you're running for another seat? So. The weird thing is, is at the city level, so we had a few councillors run for mayor. They didn't have to resign to do it. But, okay. But Mitzi Hunter did have to. Okay. Okay. So continue she was, on. And she was the only one who so, had to. So she resigned. So her spot at the provincial level became available. Gary Crawford ran for it. <laughs> and there was something about his uh was it Phil was it his severance package or something I can't Yeah remember. it was it was a severance if so, he won and became the MP for I think that was Scarborough oh sorry MPP for Scarborough Guildwood uh he wouldn't no have been severance, eligible yeah. for his severance which is why it really felt oh my god Gary Crawford. So so, so he it, resigned it, and then Parthi Candeville ran and won um and, and and here we are. And uh, unfortunately, now I, I'm not sure if they're gonna do an election or appoint someone uh, in Councilor Robinson's award. But we'll have to find. We'll have to wait and see. They'll probably run a by-election because traditionally, this far in, I would assume they would. But Ontario's yeah, one there's of those still more than two years where you can you can actually appoint candidates, which still blows my mind. Um, okay. Who's the opposition to Olivia Chow right now? Who on council? Is there a group? Because every minis- every large city I look at, there's always that one or two councillors who uh, who sort of form the official opposition, even though municipal politics does not have official oppositions. They are just all individual independent candidates, unless you live in uh, Edmonton, Calgary, downtown uh, Vancouver, or Montreal, where there's actual political parties. Toronto, there isn't. So... Is there an opposition or is it all Team Toronto right now? I would say Absolutely. there's one that sticks out, maybe two. And okay. uh, I always going to say the same. I always tease Philip and call him his boy, uh, Councillor uh, Counselor Holiday. Well, he was the one that voted against a motion today, one of 23 that voted, and he was the only opposition to the six story, 60 story. Uh, uh, building complexes in downtown, and I was like, "Oh, that's weird." That's for our one boy. person to one nope. person to hold out. <laughs> I, I can guarantee you one thing: if the rest of council is going to vote one way, Stephen Holiday is going to vote the other way. Doesn't matter what the issue is. You were going to add something, Philip? So, yes. Now, what's fun is I actually wouldn't characterize Stephen Holiday as being oppositional to Olivia Chow. I would characterize Stephen Holiday as being oppositional to the city of Toronto. He just, he loves to vote no. He, I, I think, I think it brings him great pleasure. Now, if I, if I want to say that as a counselor who I would consider oppositional to Olivia Chow is former mayoral candidate Brad Bradford, where it really feels like a lot of his motions are sort of brought up in his mind as oppositional to how Olivia Chow is running the city. Do you think, do you see him on the ballot in 2026 again for mayor? I I say this, oh, that's a good question because I feel like he's got a pretty solid base in Beaches, East York, but except when he ran for mayor, he did embarrassingly poorly in that riding. He bur- uh, so he, clearly he burned a lot of his goodwill during that. Well, especially a, a lot of people thought Brad Bradford, when he was running for counselor, he sort of ran on a on a progressive platform, kind of, you know, bike lanes. I guess really bike lanes is, is the main thing you're bringing up. Like the municipal mayor, version of Nate Erkin Smith, right? He kind of was the municipal version of Nate, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. You know, and they actually are the same riding too. So yeah, yeah I think that's a good that's a good uh comparison. Yeah. <laughs> I know things. 
<laughs> I love it. I'm so oh. grateful for you. <laughs> You're welcome there, Philip. Uh, where does the city council go from here? Because this this was a big turnover year for the last election in 2022. And this kind of new council is still finding its sea legs, it seems like. But do you see there's going to be a high turnover? Because here in Calgary, because I'm just trying to make some analogies here, here in Calgary, we saw a massive turnover in 2021. Like we probably had the majority of councillors in Calgary be new compared to returning or incumbents. Uh, and there is speculation that a lot of those first term councillors are going to get a big uh, beating in the next election because of issues that they've raised, the housing strategies that they've put forward. Do you see a sense that people in Toronto are getting concerned or sort of frustrated on what's going on at downtown city hall. I'll start with Philip on this because Matthew's taken the last few. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I haven't gotten too much of a sense that there's, there's too much. I want to say specific instances of people being sick of their individual counselors. Like I could, I could bring up my own griefs with many of them. For example, we just had Nick Mantis, Scarborough. He's he's one of the Scarborough Awards. Um, this this will sound unrelated. And I, I say this because it feels like no one has made it a controversial thing. He went on this, it was a city trip to Italy. And then he, he missed his plane. He spent extra on like luxury cars. He didn't like his accommodation, so they changed it up. So all of those like funds that he spent, he came to city council to ask to be reimbursed. Now, I think that's a disgusting waste of money. And I would, if I were in his ward, I'd be so mad about that. But I, again, nobody's really talking about it. It's, it's very silent about those sorts of little things. So I, I don't really know where people are in terms of if they're truly feeling upset by this council. Matthew? Well, I mean, there were a couple... I think a couple counselors that came back to be part of John Tory's. Uh, Are you going to talk about the re-election? Are you going to talk about the re-election signs? Please talk about the re-election yes. signs because I know you in, have an issue with it. <laughs> in my own ward, ward one. Now, Vincent Crisanti, he's a great guy. Good guy. But he was misleading during the 2022 election. I went to the... Um, the all candidates thing. And his sign says reelect. It's disingenuous because he lost to Michael Ford. And the only reason that um, Michael Ford is not still city councilor is because he moved up to provincial, provincial politics. So we had, um, I don't know, a shoestring of, of fill ins. And then now we have the 2022 election and he's with the sign re-elect <laughs> uh, um, Vincent Crisanti. And I'm like, that's that's disingenuous. Now, he he played it off like, oh, you know, you know, when Michael Ford was elected to the province, the community, they still had my phone number. They called me. You need to run again. You need to run again. So that's the way he answered the question. I, it wasn't satisfying to me, but um, if I had to have a gripe with any other city councillor. I be uh, I believe it's uh, Ward 24. I do not understand how Michael Thompson is still a city councillor. I don't know if you've been keeping up with this, but he's currently uh, been criminally charged um, with two counts of sexual assault. John Tory did not make him resign. Olivia Chow has not made him resign. Last summer at a Carib Caribbean carnival, something, she was dancing with him on stage. He's been a part of the the FIFA, which I, I, I'd love to talk about that. He's, mm. he's a part of the FIFA group. Uh, it's going to look really bad on Olivia Chow if and when he has to resign because he's been found guilty. Again, so he's we don't know what's found guilty. He's actually no, been no, found no, guilty. No, no, it's still, it's still. He's okay, been so these orders. are all allegations until proven guilty in the court Correct. of law. I just want to make Correct. sure I say that on the show because <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I don't want to get sued. <laughs> so. No, no, absolutely. But 
But with every other politician that's ever had any issues, they always resign, don't they? No. Really? <laughs> I feel like very rarely do they resign when there's issues. I was going to literally, literally your sort of political hero there, Matthew, didn't resign. <laughs> oh, oh <I> mean, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> Sorry, this is, I hope we're all in, I hope this is all a laugh of enjoyment and not a laugh of mockery. Rob. No, Phil, I'm just, you know, I, no, I'm not trying yeah. to be rude. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but there was some issues with him and he fought through it. And this is where I was going to go with a little bit later, but we'll, because literally we're about 45 minutes in. So hopefully you guys have an extra 15, 20 minutes for me. Hey, um, I, I, I want to, I want to talk about provincial and federal <laughs> politics dynamics here in two seconds, but I want to, go back to the scandals that come out of Toronto because I don't know what it is about Toronto City Council but it seems and it might be just because there's major newspapers and there's actual coverage and they don't get the coverage in smaller communities as traditionally they used to but I ask this question sincerely do you think John Tory could have survived if he would have stayed on yes, yes. do you think he should have like no, no, he no. did the right thing. Okay, oh, we're in stereo. He, he, he did the right <laughs> no because we're we're aligned on this. He did the right thing to resign, and it's very annoying because as the mayoral by election was coming up and polls were coming out about you know who would be in the lead, including before Olivia Chow was running, she was you know fairly solidly in the lead. But another hypothetical that kept coming up in those polls was simply John Tory running again, which. A would have been insane. Like what a what a great use of money that would have been. But I'll love Patrick would have been, Brown. Yeah, kind of. Like he was on the top of the list. He would have been reelected. Good times, good times. Okay, so let's talk about FIFA for two seconds. I'll throw it over to Matthew because I don't know what you're talking about for FIFA. So what's what's going on with FIFA? Because I know they are coming in, I think it's 2025, 2026 uh, to North America because Edmonton is one of the arenas, Vancouver, Toronto, and there's like nine down to the States. But uh, is there big controversy over FIFA in, in Canada right now? So sometime, I think it was in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, 2021, um, city council talked about this in council and they made the decision. We will bid if we can get the provincial and the federal government on board with funding. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't bid without, we will not bid. Actually, I believe is what the ruling was. We will not bid without provincial or federal, uh, uh funding on the day he resigned. He signed the letter of intent to make the bid for FIFA. I'm talking about John, John Tory. Tory. Yeah, okay. He did that in secret. And that's why uh, the past... Uh, the past uh, it wasn't this council meeting this week. I don't even think it was the last one. I think it was the one before that. A lot of the councillors were upset. And Olivia Chow basically said, hey, I inherited this. And she's right. She did inherit that. Um... And hopefully, I think I think we got funding, some funding. Phil, we got funding, the, yeah? A little bit. Ultimately, the biggest, the most scandalous aspect of this entire thing is simply that a, a big factor of the last election, both the, the citywide election in 22 and the mayoral by-election in 23, was just talking about the fact that the city has no money. You know, our, we're dipping into the reserves um, and we're spending so much money to make these games happen. And that, that's sort of the big the scandal. That's, that's what the scandal is about, really. And, and Josh Matlow actually went into it during council a little bit more. He said, you know, because FIFA is getting the gate, plus they got the money that we, we bid because they took our bid. Um, and he said, so what if, what if FIFA, because we're going to use BMO Field, which is in, at, at Exhibition Stadium, yeah. And he said, what if FIFA sees uh, a scattering of homeless people and tells you to remove them, tells the city of Toronto to remove them, then they'll be removed? And I, I don't believe yeah, they got will. A, I don't believe he got a satisfactory answer to that question. Um, but in terms of like cleaning up the garbage of, uh, yeah, of course, the city's going to do all that stuff. But so the whole point was the FIFA deal was done under the cover of darkness. 
Okay. Okay. I want to talk about Doug Ford for a few seconds because Doug Ford's path to victory ran through rural Ontario, but it also was predicated on winning a lot of seats in downtown Toronto. And I say downtown Toronto, but I mean down, uh, Toronto as a whole. He still ca carries a lot of weight in Mississauga, in Etobicoke, because that's where he's from. And then also in Scarborough, I think in downtown, it's a little bit hit and miss because the NDP are traditionally stronger down there. But has the Doug Ford factor worn off in downtown in Toronto yet, or are people still in love with the Ford Fest and everything is great in the Ford community? Uh, well, if you don't mind, I'll start because I'm actually in his writing. Yep. Um, which funny because during the 2022 election, I didn't see. I saw some Doug Ford signs, not a lot, because it's an assumed. Uh, it's an assumed victory. Um, I think it's if it's not a Tobico, I'm not going to speak for Scarborough. Phil will um, downtown. The, it's not it's not good. But in order, I, I, I'm not sure if this is where you're going, but in order for there to be uh, a government other than Doug Ford, you have to have a viable leader. And um, and Phil and I have, you know, we we go from our municipals to our federal pals hat and sometimes we have our provincial pals hat on um, and we both have legitimate gripes with both Bonnie Crombie and Merritt Stiles, uh, not to get too far ahead, but. Well, you have gripes I mean, with all so, three of them, right? Because you, correct. You, you have Absolutely. talked openly that you were a Doug Ford supporter, and now you are uh, sort of an oblivious, like I am, federally uh, political leaner because you don't know who to vote for because they all seem like there's there's no strong leadership. Like back in the days when Mike Harris was around, Mike Harris, Ernie Eves, like as much as we all might love to hate them because I grew up in Ontario, so I went through the education system during the Mike I, Harris years, so I know Mike <laughs> Harris quite well. <laughs> Ah, if, I can, if I can beg your indulgence, I've told this story on our show. I, just a quick story. Um, September 2001, before 9-11, there was a press conference in Nathan Phillips Square to announce WWF coming to, well, it was WWF at the time, coming to uh, Toronto for WrestleMania the following year in 2002. Uh, uh, Mel Lastman was there. Mike Harris oh. was there. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, uh, any wrestling figures, but there is a commentator that uh, we all grew up with. If you watched wrestling, you know who Jim Ross is. Um, so Mel Lastman was talking. And then Mike Harris got up to talk. And I've never seen an entire crowd of people boo this man out of the building. J.R. Jim Ross had to get out of his seat. And kind of give you that, you know, your, 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 you know, the way your dad would look at you if you're doing something wrong. And then Matthew. we all qu quieted down. Matthew, what? you've never you've never seen a politician be booed like that in the city of Toronto? Not in 2001. Yeah. Oh, sorry, because I was going to say, uh, are you, <laughs> you, did you not see the Toronto Raptors celebratory parade where, you know, it was... John Tory, woo, yeah, woo. Justin Trudeau, woo, yeah, woo. Doug Ford, woo. Like, hey, did you not see that? I missed the parade. So, so out in Scarborough, is Doug Ford a factor still, or did the NDP have a chance of picking up, or is Bonnie Crombie potentially the Liberals' white, and, white knight in armor here? Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm showing a bit of my... my um, my political, let's call it political intolerance. I, I signed up to be an Ontario liberal because it was free and because I wanted to vote specifically against Bonnie Crombie. And then, you know, the day to vote, I ended up being too busy to vote. I, I could complain about any of that stuff, but um, I do get the sense that Scarborough is sort of more NDP aligned. I know Scarborough Guildwood went to the liberals. That's uh, Hazel is the MPP there. Hazel, not McCallion. Well, that that's that's name. she's Guildwood has been a, a liberal stronghold for a while because it was in yeah. the last election, even though it was very close in the last election. It's been in the liberal camp for a while. I think the very frustrating thing about being a Torontonian again, I, I do feel as if Etobicoke is definitely more friendly to uh, Doug Ford, 
But for the most part, what feels so frustrating about a Doug Ford premiership, uh, especially when you look at it via polling, I hope you'll mind that I'm sort of extending this thought from Toronto to polling, is you'll see these polling questions that are like, you know, how do you feel this government is doing on like these various files? And it's all like failing, you know, uh, transit, healthcare, education. It's like, yeah, the government is dropping the ball. And then it's, well, who you're going to vote for in the next election? Well, Doug Ford, of course. <laughs> like it's, it's still projecting that the next election is going to be a Doug Ford majority. And it's just, it's, it's almost frustrating. It feels like, uh, I'll bring it back to Toronto here. It feels like the more Doug Ford dicks around in Toronto, because that's what it feels like he's doing, especially with like Ontario Place, the Science Center, like needless remove. Um, it feels like the more he dicks around Toronto, admittedly, it's our fault. We're the center of the universe. <laughs> uh, the more the rest of the province is like, we love this. Please keep it up. It's it it feels very like like we're stuck with what the rest of the province is doing. And again, that's it is a very self centered view. And you'll forgive me because we are the center of the universe. As an Albertan who originally originally from Ontario, <laughs> Alberta, I gotta say, er, Torontonians. <laughs> uh, so I want to turn to the next election that is coming up and that is going to be in 2025 and that is justin trudeau bent's uh pierre polyev there is a mini election that is taking place in toronto literally as we're talking right now and that is the by-election of toronto st paul's carolyn bennett's old riding has been a long long-term liberal riding for some years i think way going back to the almost to the 80s when carolyn bennett even prior to that i think it was 84 when it was a conservative when malt rooney swept but i'm not 100 percent sure um how's justin trudeau playing in toronto right now is he not god's grace to everyone or is he fallen so far from grace that pierre polyev has a chance to win sweep toronto potentially you go ahead phil I, I don't think Pierre is going to sweep Toronto. And that's not that's not necessarily an anti-Pierre sentiment. I, I just don't get the sense that Toronto is going to overwhelmingly vote conservative. Even, even in the current by-election that you brought up, Toronto-St. Paul's, I think it's going to be a, a liberal victory. But if it's a close race, I think it's still a victory for the conservatives. I think that's still you know increasing their mind share. Um, so I think it, it really, we'll see how it plays out. If it's like a blowout for the liberals, then I would say, um, good for the liberals. If it's close, I feel like it's good for the conservatives. I just want to say, you know, that, uh, Josh Matlow made the right decision not to, not to move up. Um, even though he could have not attaching yourself to Justin Trudeau, uh, because it's He's attaching to himself to Bonnie Crombie though. A little he, bit, went, yeah. he went out to Milton and campaigned for the by-election in Milton a lot. I saw that and I found that very suspicious. Go ahead. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> um, I I honestly believe that, uh, you know, we, we had this discussion um, February 29th. I predicted there would be a walk in the snow again, a la his father, and I was wrong. Um, it's very clear to me that he's not going to resign. He's going to run in this election and he's going to get slaughtered in the same manner that Kathleen Wynne got slaughtered. Um, I, I don't think he's going to lose official party status, uh, because I just don't, because it's, it's a lot bigger. Uh, but I predict a strong, um, Pierre Polyev majority government. Now, with that being said, um, I know you didn't ask, but I'll, I'll offer it. I have been against parties. Doesn't matter the political stripe. Um, I'm going to vote independent because, well, that's that's the way I, I believe. The only time that that changes is if we're leading up to this election. And for whatever reason, people start drinking. I, I apologize, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little... Anti the orange Trudeau. crush. <laughs> if people start, oh please, nobody's pe drinking the orange crush this election. No, no. If if people start drinking the Trudeau Kool Aid again, I 
I might be forced to vote for Pierre Polyev. And although I think he's entertaining, um, I, I, I would sleep better at night if I could vote independent. But I, I do believe that Pierre Polyev is going to win and he's going to, as Phil said, I'm sure because you've heard our, our, our episode in the beginning, we when we have the the song going and the the quotes, the very last thing Phil says is, "The moment we go to an election will be the end of uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau." So I'm gonna. This is my prediction. I know I didn't ask for it, but I'm gonna tell you right now because I think I've been quite open about this. I think he is going to take a walk in the snow, but I don't think it's going to happen this summer. I think it happens in probably September, October. Leadership race in February gives the next leader 10 months to run up until the next uh, October 2025 election. The only reason I say that is because, and I just wrote an article about this, and this is why. I think everyone who is a liberal right now needs to be watching what is going on in the United Kingdom. Richie Sunak, the leader of the Conservative Party, who is 20 points behind Keir Starmer, just ran, just decided that, hey, we're going to go to the election on July 4th. Why? Because we're 20 points behind, and that's the cool thing to do. If Richie Sunak can win, and I, that's a big if, just like he has <laughs> instrumental odds against uh, Keir Starmer, like Justin Trudeau has against uh, Pierre Polyev. If Richie Sunak can win and pull out a win somehow in a six-week campaign, Trudeau stays. If Sunak loses and loses big, he watches what that what goes on there, and he has to think hard this summer. He has one last barbecue circuit in him. He resigns potentially. Hey, we're going to resign February 28th, become the... 10th longest serving prime minister beating i think uh just just eking out stephen harper by like one or two days and that's why. barely <laughs> there's my there's my prediction for you for those who want my opinion because they listen to me all the time talk that's my opinion for this show uh before i but let you guys go can go i ahead. can i just one more thing i yeah. just want to add in that um I, i'm well i'm open to that happening that doesn't change what's going to happen on election day. I, that I still believe it will be. A, uh, oh, I think a it's going to be a majority. I just don't think it's going to be a Kathleen Wynne blowout, and I say that because Montreal will not vote for Pierre. No what? Toronto downtown they'll probably because the NDP are faltering so bad right now, and yeah. we haven't even talked about Jagmeet Singh, but. Let's be honest. It's going to be Pierre. Uh, it's going to be Justin Trudeau and uh, Jagmeet Singh's last election as leaders. Just hypothetically, there's no other plausible outcome on there. So we're going to have two new leaders. So the liberals are going to coalesce as they always do around the liberals, unless there's a Jack Layton. But there's no Jack Layton in this election, so the liberals don't have anywhere else to go, like they did in 2011. So they're just going to stay with the Liberal Party as is and just hold their breath or stay home. So. That's my, there's my, there's my, before I let you guys go, because I've taken now almost an hour and a half of your time, the municipals, you guys come out on a semi-regular basis. I don't want to say weekly basis because I notice that there's times that you do come out. There's times that you come out like twice a week for sometimes, but, uh, Bi -bi weekly. We, we used to be, we used to be weekly, but we've had, uh, between the both of us, we've had changes to our work schedule. So it's just better to do it bi-weekly. It gives us a chance to sit down and in-depthly watch uh, city council meetings. Uh, I make notes and observations and then Phil either tells me I'm right or I'm wrong. So <laughs> I riff. which is which it seems like he tells you you're wrong a lot more than he tells you that you're right. I'm just saying from the episodes that I listen to. <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> Okay, you can't say that. Okay, two seconds because I got I got to make some clarifications here because I did a deep dive on your show. Okay, and I went back and I listened to the very first like ten episodes of your show. And in the beginning of this episode, you said, "Oh yeah, I had Philip on my show during the municipal election." If you go back to listen to episode one, that is an in that is a complete lie because he even says, oh, "You both even agree on the show." No, we weren't able to because I didn't get the email until after the election because I got the email along with the election sign email. So I didn't even get the chance to talk to you during the election. And then therefore, oh, don't, 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 don't. Oh, yeah, you guys didn't. He didn't know because no, literally, literally the first five minutes of that very first episode is 
yeah, this is the very first time that we're actually meeting and talking to each other via not the email. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, no. We actually that didn't. No, no, we didn't. Remember, Philip, we didn't meet until. Uh, oh, we didn't okay, physically yeah. meet. No, we did stuff over Zoom. Uh, okay, no, but you. but the interview, the interview between us is actually on this time in history. Uh, see, <laughs> <from this club. laughs> see, I was gonna be, I was, trying, I, I was holding that back. I was like, but I, but I listened, and you, I guess you decided you didn't do the interview. Well, okay, I, I was, I was so confused because I was like, no, we, we did it, we did an interview. Okay, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was wrong. Uh, you guys can catch you can catch the municipals as you just heard over the last hour and a half. Uh, had a great conversation about what's going on in municipal world in downtown in Toronto and everything that sort of comes along with everything that goes along with Toronto federal and provincial politics as well. Um, you can catch that on Spotify and Podbean. The links to those are in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, please scroll down and you can check them out. Please subscribe to them. Uh, the links to their social media accounts will be there as well. Uh, I think we found one, but we don't talk about that one on this show because we don't agree with that one, even though that that's how we connected, but we don't connect to them because we don't like them too much because they're anti-Semitic. That's my own personal opinion. Oh, that oh, being yeah. said. Wow. Anyway, with that, uh, Matthew, Philip, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to talk to people who are passionate about municipal politics as I am. So thank you so much for taking time in your busy schedule to do this. Well, thank you so much for having us. I've been looking forward to this all week. I want to thank everyone for tuning in for today's episode of Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all of our content coming up, including the FCM conference in Calgary, Alberta, where we will be attending. And we are excited to be there listening to the speeches and we'll be bringing you them after the convention is wrapped on June 9th. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the cross-border interview website or in the show notes below until next time stay informed stay engaged and most importantly and as always just keep talking